So this is a panel that was originally scheduled to take place at South by Southwest uh, and did not for all the reasons we know. But I really do appreciate that these three fine individuals made the time to get back together in this new virtual environment and talk about Section 230, which we debated whether it was going to seem awfully esoteric given the world we now live in. And I think the answer is no. In some ways, while it's not urgently relevant this second, in fact, you could argue, as I think we will in the next hour or so, that it may be more urgent, not that far down the road. So with that, I'd like to just ask each of our guests to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about Section 230 and why it matters to them, and then we'll move on to talk more specifically about Section 230 and communications broadly. So with that, Yael, if you would begin. Um, hi, I'm Yael Eisenstadt. I am a visiting fellow at Cornell Tech in their Digital Life Initiative. Um, I come at this from a background actually in the national security and foreign policy world well before going into the tech world. Uh, spent the first half of my career at the CIA and then as a diplomat and then at the White House uh, as in one of the national security advisors um, on the vice president's team. Uh, but the role that I most recently held uh, was at Facebook. I went in to be what was called the head of global elections integrity operations. Um, for their political advertising side of the house. And so obviously I've put a lot of thought, I did, I mean, no secret, I was gone within six months, uh, and I've put a lot of thought over the last year and a half about sort of the underlying systemic issues that I think um, really matter for the future of uh, democracy, political speech, civil discourse, all of these things that social media has, has really changed. Um, question for you do you want one of us to kind of explain the background of section 230 or we'll, we'll get there in a moment after everybody okay. we'll we'll, we'll so get to the yeah i'll just finish with and the reason why um section 230 is one of the topics that interests me is um what brought me to facebook and to the tech industry to begin with was really how is this industry affecting civil discourse because to me, the breakdown of civil discourse is part of what is hindering our democratic process and is really affecting um, democracy around the world. And so I started looking really at where does the responsibility lie in some of this. And I don't think Section 230 is an end all be all solution for anything, but it is one of the issues I really like to discuss. Excellent. David? Great. Steve, thanks for bringing us all together. Um, and I hope that, uh, that my connection is working here. So I, I teach law at the University of California at Irvine. And I also have an appointment from the United Nations where uh, I'm called the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression. And basically I monitor free speech issues worldwide. So I tend to look at issues of internet speech from a global perspective, not a particularly American uh, perspective, but of course, most of the companies that dominate uh, the you know, public square worldwide, if we want to call it that, are American. And so American law, uh, American attitudes, uh, and company attitudes make a huge difference. And so I think a lot about the companies and their relationship with individuals, with their users, with the public, um, in all parts of the world and particularly I've been interested and I wrote a book about kind of the interaction between the companies uh, and governments um, in this space uh, it's called speech police and um, and for me the big question around section 230 but also around similar rules around the world is who should be deciding these questions should should these questions of say misinformation or hate speech or other topics, should they be decided by the companies or should they be decided by governments? And what are the trade-offs that are that are part of those those kinds of questions? Perfect. And speaking of governments, Ellen, tell us about what you've done in your life and what you're doing now. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna tell you everything that I've done in my life. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ellen Weintraub. I'm delighted to be with this esteemed panel and uh, thank you to Steve for uh, organizing this virtually. 
Uh, I'm a commissioner at the Federal Election Commission. Federal Election Commission is all about money and politics and how people uh, raise and spend money to get their political message out and how they use various media. We, uh, the Section 230 is actually part of uh, the FCC's jurisdiction more than the FEC's jurisdiction. So why is a federal election commissioner talking about federal communications law? Because there is more and more political activity and political speech going on online. Uh, and it has, um, it has become uh, a place where originally everybody was so giddy about the prospect of political activity on the internet it was going to bring the price down it was going to be great from the money and politics perspective uh and uh it was going to be a great mechanism for organizing and for meeting people and for people to to um do activism and get together and form communities in ways that they were never able to do before and people were just ecstatic at the prospect. So when the FEC looked at regulating internet political activity on the internet back in 2006, we took a very light hand. But I think what we have seen in the intervening years is that it is not only, it does all those positive things, but also has been a place for disinformation and misinformation and divisiveness and polarization and a lot of negative trends that are undermining our democracy. And I think we have to look at these issues big picture. I don't think government should be siloed and, you know, this person looks at this uh, slice of the issue and that person looks at that slice of the issue. And I think the accountability of the platforms has to be part of, this, of the discussion. So who wants to take on the the granimal sized explanation of 230? I'll just start by saying this. For many years, Section 230 was thought of as the thing that birthed the Internet. I mean, it was held in very high esteem as essentially the government's the brilliant decision to essentially stay the hell out and let it evolve. And then at some point we could pick a, a date on the calendar. Interestingly enough, both Republicans and Democrats, for different reasons, seem to think it's outlived its usefulness. But can can anyone just take a, a stab at if I messed it up? Like what what is 230 for people that kind of are interested but could use to make sure they're getting it right? Yeah. I don't. Maybe I'll just maybe my just very quickly my view of what Section 230 does, and this is sort of without thinking about it in its you know hyper technical legal aspect is that it immunizes the companies uh, from, from two perspectives. It immunizes them uh, again uh, for the hosting of content um, of all sorts. So if, you know, if somebody posts something that is, uh, that is hate speech or is, even, or is defamatory, let's say, the platform is not liable for that the person who posted the content would be. So that's one form of liability that is avoided here. And the other part of it, which makes it really kind of a complete kind of um, uh, kind of immunity, is that um, the companies have immunity from the decisions they take to take down content as well. So, I mean, I do think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of truth in the idea that Section 230 created the space for the companies to to de to develop to innovate to create their own rules of what's acceptable and what's not on their platforms because they didn't have the shadow of liability hanging over them but that i mean that's a big picture there's a lot that goes into section 230 but from my perspective and for our discussion i think those are to my mind sort of the major uh, the major points yeah i mean I'm a, i might just add one quick thing, if I can, just as for people who aren't familiar, as familiar as we are with this debate every day, just to remember that it was it was written in 1996, right? So I think that's really important to remember. It was written before any of these social media platforms even existed. And the intent was, was good. The intent was so that the internet could grow. Um, so if, you know, somebody post something, I mean, if somebody posts something, the, the intermediary is not the one who's responsible. It should be me who's responsible if I post something inflammatory or illegal or whatever. So it makes sense in that respect, but it also envisioned a very different sort of what an intermediary was back in 1996. So 
I just I want to like put in that um, reminder of it's it's not necessarily should we strike it down or keep it. It's a question of um, is it relevant still today in the way it's written. So, so I think that's exactly the right question. And I think maybe the, the, the person to bring into this is David. David, you know, it often gets kind of structured as free speech versus censorship. In your role at the UN, in terms of monitoring free expression globally, how do you view this debate, particularly as a global conversation as opposed to a US centric conversation? Yeah, I so I, I mean, I see Section 230 as indeed part of a broader debate that's happening worldwide over who should be making the decisions about what content is legitimate and illegitimate online. So Section 230 has analogs around the world in, in the European Union. For example, there's something called the e-commerce directive. And, um, and there's similar rules in all different jurisdictions. And what we're seeing is increasing pressure on the platforms to, uh, to make sure that they're taking down content. It's mostly about taking down content that those jurisdictions think is illegal under their law. But it's problematic in a couple of, uh, of ways. And I think as we think about 230, these are the things we need to avoid. Um, for one thing, these, um, these rules around the world are saying to the companies, you make the decisions. Here's what our law is, but you make the decisions. So they're essentially outsourcing mm -hmm. the decision making to companies. And there isn't the accountability of public law, such as the courts, to, to evaluate that. The other part of it, and then I'll, I'll just stop at this, is that uh, law around the world is putting so much pressure on the companies, which you know may or may not be legitimate, but it's happening in such a way with such high potential penalties on the companies that the companies are in all likelihood taking down a lot of legitimate content. They're, they're in a way over-regulating. And so as we think about what we want to see in terms of Section 230, and that would only apply in the American, in the jurisdiction of the United States. We need to be careful to make sure that the rules don't incentivize the companies to take down, you know, the good, robust political debate that we want to see out there. And that that's a big tension around the world. And that's putting I, I'm basically framing this in the context of states that are are in good faith trying to regulate this space. Uh, there are many, many, many governments out there that aren't doing this in good faith, that they just want to impose you know, real censorship uh, on, um, on their environments and limit the amount of debate that can take place online, particularly when it comes to government criticism. Hey, Al, your, your, your point of view on this, free speech versus you know, censorship, where, 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 does, where does the future of 230 lie? Um, and maybe just to put a kind of a, a narrower point on it, um, do you think it should be left alone or do you think it needs to be reworked? I absolutely think it needs to be reworked. I do not think we need to scrap it. So I think part of the part of the problem around the debate about Section 230 is this sort of absolutist debate like everything, right? It's either kill all innovation or ensure that it's a free market of ideas. It's either, you know, censorship or freedom of speech. And, and I kind of look at it a little bit differently. And again, I come at, at it at the, from the lens of, I do believe that right now there is just absolutely no accountability or responsibility for, I'm obviously I'm thinking about the biggest platforms. Obviously I'm thinking about Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. I, I'm not thinking about every single intermediary in the world. Um, but right now they have no responsibility at all except for a very few specific carve outs that are actually already illegal for the content that they host. And that's, that's, that's one way of looking at it, but I look at it a little bit different. And um, you know, if people have heard all these debates about is Facebook a publisher or a platform, that's actually about this debate. Because as long as they are a platform as opposed to media or a publisher or, or you know, a media outlet, they get this immunity. And I would just offer it, it it's first of all, I do not want government, by the way, to make it clear, I do not want government being the one to decide what speech should or should not be on the Internet. 
except for in the most extreme illegal cases or, you know, in the most extreme circumstances, I do not want the government to be the ones to decide what should or shouldn't be uh, hosted online. What I do want, though, is I want to think about this in a new way that actually applies in 2020 as opposed to in 1996 when this was written. So a platform like Facebook, for example, they don't just host content. They're not just a neutral intermediary. Their algorithms are deciding how they are curating content. Twitter's algorithms are deciding what's being boosted, what's being amplified. And I won't give the whole attention economy speech right now, but there's many studies out there that show this business model, this amplification in order to keep us addicted to your screens is why the most salacious content is winning. And so the way I look at it is, you're right, they're not a plat they're not a neutral platform and they're not a publisher. The New York Times, I don't want them to be regulated the exact same way I want Facebook to be regulated. Because the New York Times actually has a fact check, they have a whole journalistic process. Facebook, it's a free for all. I would like to say, well, why don't we actually create a new category that's neither publisher nor platform, that's like a digital curator, and then figure out where does the responsibility lie in that? How do you make their algorithmic decision making more transparent so that we can say, it's not that you're responsible for the fact that this disinformation is on your platform. You're responsible for the fact that your algorithm decided to amplify it to 2 billion people, whereas before that person would have gotten no carry. That's where I would like to rethink this. It's, it's that, how are you amplifying content? How are you connecting people? Like, is it possible that your algorithm has actually connected this kind of content to vulnerable youth who are actually vulnerable to being exploited by a global terrorist network or whatever it is? And so it's, it, I look at it very differently than just the black and white, are they a publisher or a platform? Which is why the the whole word we debated the word debate versus revisiting and the idea right. of debate you think so so Ellen at the FEC you're charged with protecting the integrity of the campaign finance process how do you debate how do you view the debate around accountability in a digital world as opposed as it applies to the mandate as to your mandate. And, and let me start off by saying, thank you for the question, and uh, let me start by saying that I agree with everything that was uh, just said by both Yale and David, particularly the part about how we don't want government being the ones to decide what people get to say. I think that we have seen particularly recently some really disturbing trends around the world in certain authoritarian governments really taking advantage of the current health emergency in order to uh, adopt even stronger controls on what people are uh, allowed to say and not allowed to say in the guise of protecting people from health misinformation. But uh, in fact, probably uh, designed to avoid criticism of the government and uh, I don't I don't advocate are are going down that road and and uh, honestly I don't even know anybody who does so as the government actor let me say explicitly that I I do not want that authority uh, what what we are all about at the FEC is disclosure that is the core of our mission and um, part of my concern about what's going on on the internet is that it is obscuring rather than illuminating who is behind the messages. Uh, what we saw in 2016 where people were inadvertently amplifying messages and sharing uh, content that came from Russian troll farms. I don't think anybody wants to be getting their news from a Russian troll farm, uh, which of course raises another issue of um, uh, the way the platforms were used in 2016 and, and likely are again in 2012. Uh, to um, uh, as a vehicle for foreign intervention in our elections. Uh, that is part of our portfolio to, pr to protect our elections against foreign interference. And, um, and the platforms really uh, own some responsibility for that. So Yael, you wrote a pretty controversial uh, op-ed in the Washington Post a while back uh, it was not that long ago, but it seems like a long time ago. Um, and I'm just curious as to, you know, wh where, do you, where do you end up on all of this? You know, you, you essentially said Facebook is, is taking money, is getting paid to uh, essentially amplify bad information, which may have been part of why you weren't there very long. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, someday you'll write a book about that and we'll all read it. But but talk a little bit about, you know, kind of Section 230 relative to your position on Facebook. 
Sure. So some people would say that that topic, because that, I'll give you the context of when I wrote it. It was, you might recall, um, there was some controversy. President Trump had run an ad and it had used a bit, some altered media in it about another candidate and it created a firestorm. And that was the moment that made Facebook stand up and say, we will not fact check political candidates. And Ellen also, Ellen and I wrote very similar pieces actually about this, this same situation. Um, and some people would say political advertising has nothing to do with Section 230. And, and yeah, there are different rules that should go around political advertising, but this is why I decided to write. In that moment, Facebook not only said, we will not fact check um, political candidates, they said, because we believe in freedom of speech, and they said, because we don't want to be the arbiters or truth. And that was a moment where I was like, well, actually, <laughs> let's, let's call this what it is. I believe in freedom of speech. I swore an oath to the Constitution and government to protect our Constitution, which includes freedom of speech. But when you are taking money from political candidates for advertising, this is not free speech. This is paid speech. You are profiting off of it. And not only are you profiting off of it, your micro-targeting tools are making it so that it actually can be misused to be the exact opposite of creating an open... Because the other thing Facebook said was... And therefore, political speech, I think they said political speech is the most scrutinized speech already. That's what they said. And therefore, we shouldn't be the ones to fact check it. Well, political speech can only be scrutinized if we're all seeing the same thing, right? Political speech can only be scrutinized if we all saw the same commercial, even if not all, even if it's just everybody within a zip code all saw the same commercial. Then we could come around together, you know, when we're not social distancing and get to come together again around the water cooler and talk about that and really debate it. But right now, with their micro-targeting tools, even the person across the street from me and I, we might be seeing two totally different versions of the same ad. And one might be have even have altered video, synthetic media, and it might just be a flat out lie. And that is targeted to us based on all of the data that Facebook has gathered on us, all of the way they put us into these categories so that they can sell us other kinds of ads. I really don't care as much if they're selling me a Nike versus Reebok ad. I do care if they're selling me political speech targeted to what they already know are my vulnerabilities. And so I had to call that one out. And now how does it apply to Section 230? It's not a direct application, but it is enough. It is 2020, enough of this talking point that they don't bear any responsibility for any of the consequences of any of the things that are happening on their platform. They are profiting off of manipulative tools I don't think I, I think I missed a syllable there, manipulative <laughs> uh, tools that they then sell to political operatives, that they then get to target us with different versions of speech. And I think that is excessively harmful to our democracy. So that's why I spoke up. And I do think there is a Section 230 role in that as well. Uh, if you had to be more transparent about how you are amplifying content, about how your micro-targeting tools work, about the data you have on me, and why am I being targeted differently than my next door neighbor, I think that would change the game. All right, so I'm gonna ask a dummy question. Ellen, why haven't we already solved this? I mean, there's there are rules for broadcasting about how political ads work. Why don't we just take those rules and glue them on top of the social media platforms and call it a day is it does can't we just isn't it just a light switch that we get to throw and then everything's magically better well the i don't know that it's gonna be magically better but yes i believe that the that, that digital political advertising should be subject to the same rules that broadcast political advertising uh are and there are bills in congress to achieve that but they have not passed and unfortunately this has all become a partisan issue uh as much of campaign finance law has um it didn't used to be that way there used to be basic principles like disclosure that everybody agreed on yes we want to know who's behind political advertising we want to know who's behind political spending and and anything that would uh, address any kind of campaign finance uh, regulation, whether it is, um, uh, re regardless of topic almost, even if it goes to just this basic principle of let's just get more information out there, as the Supreme Court has repeatedly said, in order to have a better informed electorate, these, these are good things, they, they're, they're just bottled up in Congress. This is not something I can do by regulation. Uh, this is something that really would require congressional action to apply the same rules to digital ads that we have on broadcast ads. 
So that's Can why I it hasn't happened. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I yeah, I just want to pick up on on a theme that that I'm I'm hearing from Ellen and Yael, and it's around transparency and disclosure. I, you know, I think it's really important for us to frame the transparency and disclosure part of this also as a freedom of speech issue. It's a freedom of access to information, mm -hmm. and and I think one of the the real great harms right now is that. Um, the companies are opaque. They're op algorithmic side, as Yael was uh, was was talking about. They're opaque on the political advertising side. They're opaque on their you know. There's no form of of like case law from the companies so that we can look at. Oh well, how are you actually making these decisions around different kinds of content? And and I think that. You know, as we think about it, and, and as Ellen was suggesting, it, it's not like you can just wave a wand and suddenly, you know, there's a new, uh, you know, there's new legislation that that is bipartisan and everybody agrees to. But that is clear to my mind. That is clearly the first step before we get into because I think we all agree government stepping into content regulation is is anathema. I mean, it's certainly inconsistent with the First Amendment, so it's not going to work here. But the disclosure part is absolutely essential, and I and I really think we should frame that as a free speech issue. It's 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 our it's about the health of our democracy. Can I? Can I add oh, go ahead, Ellen. No, we all want to talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I I completely agree with that. The our all of our First Amendment jurisprudence says that the uh, if you don't like what somebody is saying, then you should get out there and make a better argument on the other side and persuade people that you're right and they're wrong. This whole doctrine of counter speech is inherent in our in our First Amendment jurisprudence, but it assumes, as Yale was saying, that you can hear the arguments on both sides. And in some and in some cases, not only is the person next door not getting the same advertising that you're getting, but the person sitting across the table from you in your own home might be getting different advertising than you're getting because it, it is micro-targeted to that degree based on data that nobody really voluntarily gives up. This is just sort of drawn from every click, every share, every like, every every dislike that we do online. The the platforms are just sucking up all of this information about us. And it is and and I don't think any Anybody is sitting there saying, "Oh yeah, I want I want the uh, platforms to have all this information about me, so that they can give me a a personal." Oh no, stickers are so. But again, when you're talking about candidates, when you're talking about policies, it really removes accountability, not only from the platforms themselves, but also from the candidates. They don't have to come up with a broad message that appeals to a lot of people. They 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 can come up with these micro-targeted messages to appeal exactly to each individual, and then everybody thinks they're going to get a personally custom-designed candidate, and that no compromises are necessary. And the candidates aren't accountable for the messages that they're selling, because only the people who like that message are actually hearing that message. Can I pick I, up on wait, 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 wait. So I, I got to go back to David for a second, because he said something that has been chewing at the back of my head for about the last three minutes. So if, if we tell the platforms they can't be opaque and they have to be transparent, and they say, okay, fine, we're gonna tell you everybody who buys every ad and what they pay for. Don't you just run headlong into Citizens United? Because it just becomes a random well, name of unknown. Uh, I'm not sure you do. Well, okay, so, I mean, Ellen okay. Be your, your partners are saying no. So Citizen good. United question. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, no, I, Citizens I don't, United. I don't, go ahead, Dom. Go ahead, yeah. sorry. So, you know, now no, you, you really you, are. You, really you, uh, Citizens United was actually very strong on disclosure. What nobody remembers about the Citizens United case is that it started out as a disclosure case. And actually the disclosure argument won. That was the one thing that did win in the Supreme Court. Uh, it, and then they, they went beyond the, the original disclosure argument to do a lot of other things that, um, well, we won't get into that, but um, Citizens United was very strong and the court has always been very strong on the right of the in of the electorate to be informed, to have this information so that they can uh, go in and vote based on all of the information. So I think far from Citizens United undermining this argument, I think it is four square behind it. 
Can I? Yeah. So I wanted to just bring up something from my time at Facebook and broaden it a bit so that people don't think the only thing that we think applies here is for political advertising. Because so if I can give two quick examples, the funny thing is, you know, you hear companies like Facebook actually say we want to be regulated for the political advertising space. They don't say we want to be regulated for everything, but it actually would make their lives a little bit easier if we would actually regulate political advertising on their platforms. Because I'll give you one tiny example. I mean, anything that we were building, I joined them. They hired me actually the same day that Mark Zuckerberg testified on the Hill. So it, I came in right into the firestorm. And they were just building out their products, their new trans, so-called trans, I put it in quotes, they're not the most transparent tools in the world, but their so-called transparency tools around political advertising. But every, if you really paid attention, every rule there was actually still putting the responsibility on others. You report to us that something is wrong and then we will consider taking it down. It was never proactive. It's always, and, and I always viewed the reason they didn't want to take proactive measures was because they didn't want to actually open the door for this 230 debate. But I also want to point out it's not just political advertising, right? Like part of the thing when when um, Ellen and I were in D.C. for this DOJ all day workshop um, on Section 230, part of the conversation also is about, oh, but then you're just going to open the floodgates for lawsuits. Every single person who feels they've ever been victimized on the Internet is just going to sue now. And yes, that, that is possible. But there were two different attorneys there. They were amazing. These two women who were representing real victims of things that had happened on the online world. And they were all pointing out, but in the United States, you're supposed to actually have the right to face your, the, you, you have the right to recourse. You have the right to have your day in court. And right now, everything's being thrown out on the immediate, well, Section 230 immunity. I mean, if you follow this, I think it's the Grinder case, just go look it up later. It's a fascinating example. But I wanted to bring up, let's, let's bring up Myanmar. I'm sure David has thoughts on this one as well. In Myanmar, is Facebook responsible for mass killings in Myanmar? I'm not saying that's Facebook's responsibility. However, I would say when Facebook's algorithms were amplifying hate speech in Myanmar, when Facebook was not listening to experts on the ground who were telling them and warning them this was happening, it's not just that somebody wrote something on Facebook and their five followers saw it. Their algorithms were picking up this hate speech and amplifying it. Are, are you sure that we shouldn't be looking at that at all? Of well, Is there any responsibility there for the way your platform helped amplify absolute hate speech that led to a genocide this is where i cannot accept this idea that free for all there's no responsibility in anything i know i just want to make sure people realize it's not just about political advertising it's about all of these issues all right so so here's the thing that that this is why this conversation always makes my head explode because we think that the platforms probably can't regulate themselves but at the same time we don't really want the government to regulate them because Arguably, we think the government in some countries, theoretically our own, but certainly others without a doubt, will use that power for the opposite of good, that the web will become less free, the internet will be. So it's like we want this magical entity that isn't the government, but isn't Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, or, you know, to come in and set some boundaries. And I don't know what that entity is. Yeah, I. How about the U.S.? Maybe I could just say. Well, let me let me say uh, just a couple of a couple of words. So, one is I, I do think so. Part of this conversation that I think is really interesting is that I think you can imagine having um, new rules around political advertising. Um, you know that kind of paid speech that is, I think, as Yael was hinting at, is is practically I wouldn't say divorced from Section Two Thirty. Um, but is is to the side. It's sort of running parallel to the Section 230 conversation. A separate Section 230, or we could say platform liability uh, conversation, is around things like harassment, you know, forms of you know doxing um, and and hate speech and disinformation that you know may or may not be related to to political advertising or to politics at all uh, to some extent. And I think if we think of if we separate those two things out, I think it's a, a little bit more of a profitable discussion. And I think one thing that we see is 
there is a risk in talking about these other areas apart from the political advertising. At least I see this globally. There's a real big push for governments to be involved in regulating that content. And, and in fact, when you think about uh, some of the proposals that have been made uh, in Congress, they have been, and these have been particularly from the right, but not only from the right, um, have been pushing toward allowing there to be liability on, um, for the companies for some of the decisions they make around political speech, which I think is actually quite dangerous. So, I mean, I, so for me, that transparency and disclosure conversation that we were having about political advertising is actually quite relevant here as well. So I think there should be really transparency obligations around the whole range of rulemaking that the companies are engaging in and their enforcement. And I would go further and say that there's some really interesting discussion around the world on the possibility of having non-governmental oversight uh, of company decisions. Um, you know, some of this has been absorbed by this new Facebook oversight board, which Zuckerberg once called, you know, the Facebook Supreme Court. But I think that's going to be limited. And what we should be thinking about is more industry-wide oversight that could be non-governmental. That sounds weird for Americans because we're not used to it. Outside the United States, there are things like um, journalistic press councils, um, that actually do a pretty good job in a number of places that we could be thinking about as models. But that at least takes us away from having the government deciding this is content that is tolerable and this is intolerable. So, so let's get to current events. T two important things to talk about before we get specifically to COVID and how that impacts us. So Joe Biden, who now that Bernie has no longer as, as paused his campaign, as they say. Uh, Joe Biden is now the presumptive nominee, and, and he's been quite clear. Um, and, and yeah, I'll, 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 let, I'll let you excuse yourself from this part of the conversation because of your history. But but for our other panelists, I mean, Joe Biden has been quite clear about the fact that, two, you know, I think he said in his typical Biden-esque way, you know, 230 has to go. Like, not a lot of gray area. In it. Now, now, the immediate reaction that my my legal friends responded to when they heard that was, did he did like was that a policy mm -hmm. statement or was that him riffing? And but he hasn't made any clarity around it. And this is now you know a couple of months ago he said, you know, two, so you've got the Democratic presidential candidate saying that 230 either has to be reworked or in his words, removed. And there is certainly consistent activity on the Republican side to do some version of the same. So isn't it? Doesn't it seem if both of the parties effectively, for different reasons, think 230 is a problem that it's on its way into being, you know, I mean, I mean, you guys were at the DOJ thing. So, you know, what like among th smart people, you know, is it going to be renamed? Is it going to be relaunched? Is it going to be retooled? I mean, I'm happy to give a few thoughts on that that's separate from yeah. <laughs> Vice President Biden's comment. You're right. Both sides of the aisle have been talking about 230, but for very, very different reasons. Um, so I don't actually have any grand hope that they're going to come together and figure out a reasonable uh, solution. But on the DOJ side, which is where Ellen and I spent the day, it was very much on a lot of that conversation was actually around exploitation of children. And a lot of that was we as law enforcement can't do our job if we don't know what's happening online. So that's really that conversation. But what you see on the Hill a lot, you see certain lawmakers like Holly or some on the right who are claiming that they want to amend Section 230 because they believe there's an anti-conservative bias on these platforms. Whereas on the left, you have, you know, I didn't consult with him before he said this, but the, I assume the reason Vice President Biden said that was because he was actually the victim of this fake ad that Trump had run. And so, like, I assume that's why that one came up. I do think that this is one that is going to, that one of the few things that actually could have teeth, I don't see both sides coming to agreement on what it is they don't like about Section 230. But if I can also just bring up the magic wand idea, I want to make it really clear. Lots of arguments that are happening in the tech policy world are people saying, well, antitrust won't fix everything, or data privacy laws won't fix all the problems I care about, or Section 230, and, and I want to be emphatic, 
There is not one magic wand. They are all part of a bigger puzzle of how do we deal with this new reality. And not a single one of them fixes some of the real harms that are occurring online. Section 230 is just one of those pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, I want Facebook to succeed. I use it. I want to remain connected to the world. But Section 230 is the rules about who bears responsibility for the real world consequences of the way your company is made, what they're putting out in the world. And this is the only industry whose responsibility has never been defined. And I think that's what a lot of people are starting to really try to wrap their hands around. All right, so let's let's get to where we are today, because today obviously uh, is, is, you know, a lot has changed in 90 days, in, less than that in four weeks so the 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 covid 19 pandemic has changed the entire landscape from the way we work to a significant increase in our reliance on online tools and and at least for the moment it does seem like both twitter and facebook have been working pretty hard to try and get fake information off their platforms take it down quickly not sell garbage product you know like mm-hmm. if you had to score them today on how they're doing, you know, does anyone want to kind of chime in on how the platforms are doing relative to what is a pretty intense and fast moving challenge for them? I'm, I think they're do. I'm not going to give them a grade. You know, we've all moved to mandatory pass fail. Right? So, <laughs> so, you know, they're they're passing. And, and I actually think that on. Uh, on the pandemic, they're they're aggressive in in probably an appropriate way, um, but it's very early, and it's it's also because of the opacity. I mean, there's two things that are happening that I think over the medium term could be problematic. One, because they're opaque, um, and they're going to be more opaque because there's fewer people who are actually able to be in the office to do this kind of work, and you really can't. You know, minimize the importance of, of teams working together in the same room to solve some of these problems. Also, their content moderators, uh, you know, the tens of thousands of them around the world. This for all the platforms, they're all home because of a variety of different concerns. There's a lot more automation. So the what what I'm concerned about over the medium term is that a lot of information about the spread of the pandemic that might be important for communities to know. Um, it might be getting scrubbed and we don't know that. So the aggressiveness, while important when it's tied to, you know, WHO or CDC information and ensuring that, you know, what people really see is verified information around the pandemic and the disease, you know, I think we'll start to hear, uh, I imagine pretty soon about cases of, you know, taking down information that you know may have been helpful to people but we just don't see that yet it's again it's a transparency and disclosure problem and then the longer term question is you know do they apply this aggressiveness to um to political speech i mean i hope they don't um because that you know political speech is very very different even hate speech it's very very different from you know um you know, the kind of material that needs to be seen that's coming from the CDC, for example. Um, but, you know, people might get used to this kind of aggressiveness and it might be it might be problematic over the long term. So that's interesting. I'm not going to give them a grade. Um, I completely agree with David. I just want to add a little color from just my experience there. Um, I mean, I think people don't realize that the, that the idea of the content moderators having to go home, understand that most of the content moderators are contractors, so they can't work from home. There's, they're too, they have to actually be in the buildings that they were in to do that work. So now they're relying more and more on machine learning and AI, and they're going to overcorrect. So what I would say on this, though, I will give them credit for the fact that they realize that this is a real global health threat, and they have to be aggressive because lives are on the line. So I'll give them credit for that. Um, and I want them to do that. I want Google to help surface the CDC and WHO information as opposed to every Joe Blow who knows how to game an algorithm, for sure. Um, however, there's always a however. 
I, I found it really interesting on Twitter, and, and maybe I'm overinterpreting this, so please chime in if either of you think that I'm overthinking this one. But on Twitter, I was following this one, I don't even remember his name, this one guy was spreading all sorts of, like tweeting all sorts of things that were pretty, ch- oh, Sheriff Clark, I think it was, if anyone remembers the Sheriff Clark example. And they finally did take him down. But they didn't take him down for spreading disinformation. It wasn't a policy about disinformation. The Twitter policy is about tweets that could cause harm or like self-harm because he was telling everyone you should go out to crowds. And so Twitter was able to sort of twist this. Well, that would create self-harm because then you could contract the disease. We'll take it down. Why am I over explaining this? Because to me, that doesn't show that that, that's very categorized to protect themselves in the future when people start saying, well, clearly you know how to combat disinformation. Why aren't you doing it in other spaces? So I think it's interesting what policies they're leaning on right now. I agree with David. I don't want to see them take these exact same aggressive policies into political speech. However, I do believe that democracy is also in crisis. And I do believe that our public square is in crisis. And one of the first things I tried to do at Facebook when I first came on was saying, well, is there anything we can do about rampant disinformation and political advertising? And they would not touch it. So no, I don't want them to use these same aggressive tactics. But when we get out of this, and we will get out of it someday, the three questions I'm left with, and then I'll stop talking, I realize this is a long answer, sorry, is one, what can we learn from what all of these platforms did during COVID-19, as opposed to it going into a black box that we can't learn about? Did these platforms actually all coalesce around a common policy? Did they collaborate more? Because disinformation jumps from one platform to the other. So that's one. Two, now can we look at the underlying systemic issues that makes stuff like COVID-19 disinformation run rampant on your platforms? As opposed to just the whack-a-mole of what am I taking down, what is it about your algorithms that someone like Sheriff Clark knows if I write this really salacious stuff, your algorithms are going to amplify it? Can we talk about that now? Why are your platforms so set up to help spread disinformation as opposed to what should we take down? That's two. And then three, can we have a real conversation now about as opposed to calling it censorship, who do you want to be when it comes to actual political and civil discourse? Those are my three. And do not underestimate for one moment the interconnections between political speech and uh, public health speech about COVID-19. There is no way to, to comp- there, there will be some speech that is completely separate, but there is going to be a lot of speech that's, that's completely intertwined. Um, uh, what I heard was that Facebook, because of their, um, uh, they moved to AI and suddenly they were taking down everything about COVID-19. And then they realized, oh, we got to correct that. Google said they were only going to uh, allow people to talk about uh, COVID-19 if it was coming from a government source. And then um, uh, political actors said, wait a minute, we have to be able to talk about how the government is dealing with this. This will be the number one political issue in this election. And you can't say you're not going to allow us to speak on this topic. And and they immediately started to uh, revise where they were. you know. And then there was everything that happened yesterday in Wisconsin, which was all about elections and all about voting and all about public health and all about COVID-19 all at the same time. So these issues are going to be hard and they are going to be intertwined. The the platforms won't be able to duck it. So I just want to go back a sec, because Yael, you said something earlier, which I guess I should have known, but I hadn't thought of. So what you said was that all of the people that were doing content moderation couldn't just find themselves some kind of a VPN and tunnel into the systems and do their jobs? No, so this is a super complicated one. And and I think David can also speak a bit to this, it looks like. Um, So just content moderation, and and this is actually a controversial thing if you think about it. It's mostly outsourced. Um, I think maybe it was Kara Swisher or somebody during an interview once asked Mark Zuckerberg if he had ever actually done content moderation himself. And he was like, no. Well, that's part of the problem. The people who actually work full time for Facebook don't actually see some of the most horrific things that are happening on Facebook. But no, so content moderators are usually, they're outsourced, they're through a different company like Accenture or one of these other companies, and they they can't take that work home. There's so many privacy 
well, I don't know, privacy might be the wrong word, but there's so many rules around that. So that's part of the problem. It's a huge part of the problem is it's all contract work. And there's an argument to be said that some of this should be brought in house. Your company should have to actually see what some of the, and that's for like the worst content, right? For like beheadings and, and, ch- and child exploitation. They're watching these things all day, but they can't do it from home. They're not full-time employees. They're not, sorry, David probably has more on that. I saw you. No, 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 I was just going to say, I, I, I agree with, I agree with that. But it, I mean, what I would say is, I mean, I think the companies know um, what, you know, that awful content looks like, but, but it's true that, um, that, first of all, they're highly bureaucratized right now, especially Facebook. I mean, they have their their lead policy person is called what they what they do a mini legislative forum that they have every couple of weeks where they talk about you know are there rules uh, sort of meeting whatever challenge they they're seeing. But most of this, as Yael said, is being done in terms of you know what comes down and what stays up is being done by contractors around the world. And uh, Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, I think, made the decision that, you know, for privacy reasons, um, because a lot of the content that these contractors are looking at is actually, you know, personal private posts and data, they have to do it at these basically like call centers, Um, but they had to go home and they don't have the same privacy protection. So the companies explicitly have said, we are ramping up the automation to do this. And that's where, you know, we're in this situation where these, you know, we just don't have the same oversight of the actual content that we had, you know, three weeks ago. It's it's a pretty serious problem, actually. Yeah. So, Ellen, you said something earlier about Wisconsin and, you know, you know, November is not that far from now. Um, it seems like there's a political battle brewing over you know, vote from home, vote on some kind of, you know, people say casually, well, electronic voting. I'm like, didn't we just go through that and decide that was kind of dangerous? Yes. Um, but somebody said, and I didn't necessarily agree with the where it came from. Someone said yesterday when they were talking about Wisconsin, like it's no small matter to print three million envelopes and three million ballots and three million mailing envelopes and three million, you know, like, and I thought about it. I was like, yeah, you can't, you probably can't do that in two days. So like, how do we look at the election and find some way that it's not um, going to just be a complete disaster? Well, this is why we have to start planning for this now. This, it can be done. You're right, not on two days notice, but on six months notice, yes, it can. But the states are gonna need more money in order to do this. There's um, uh, there's a report from the Brennan Center with a bunch of recommendations and uh, and they've said, they've estimated it's gonna cost $2 billion uh, for all of the states to buy the equipment that they need and, and put out the information that they need. You need to inform the voters how this is gonna work. Um, there are jurisdictions that have a lot of experience in vote by mail and they could provide some expertise to their colleagues. This has been going on in in places like Washington and Colorado and Utah, places that elect Democrats, places that elect Republicans. They've been using vote by mail. They haven't seen uh, uh, any uptick in fraud. This this isn't really uh, uh, a huge problem that's been identified in the states that have the most experience with it. But we need to start now. There are bills in Congress. The last bill only had 400 million allocated to the states to deal with election related issues related to uh, the virus. And it's not enough. It's not going to be enough. But this but can the states get up to speed before November? If they start now, I believe that they can. All right. So last question. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, Each of you are super smart. Each of you know each other through professional networks and efforts. I'd like each of you to ask one of the other of you a question. (laughs) That's great. I love that, Steve. Maybe maybe I'll start. Can I can I start? Uh, Because this is a question that I have. I mean, it's a question. It's a question that I have, I mean, for myself, too. But um, and this is sort of overstating the point, but so I'd ask, I mean, it could be for any of you, um, what what um, what happens if we don't have Section 230? 
I mean, what if we don't have that protection? Like, what does that world look like? Does it look like, is it a world of, um, and we talked a little bit before about, is it a world of more litigation? Is it, is it a better world in terms of the kind of content that is both taken down and left up? Are the decisions made better by the companies if we don't have 230? That's a, that's a question that I've had. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure I know the answer to it. I don't know that I have an answer, but I have a few quick thoughts. Because that's, that's uh, as someone who doesn't actually advocate scrapping 230, I haven't thought what would it look like if we actually scrapped it. I will say if we actually scrapped it, I think the opposite of what I want would happen because I think then Facebook, Google, and Google win because they're the only ones who are big enough right now to be able to actually handle some of the things that will shut down all the smaller companies if we were to just scrap it, which is actually the whole opposite of the point of what I would like to see accomplished. I, I think, um, yes, we'd have a totally litigious society and all of that would happen, but I actually think it would consolidate even more power into the hands. This is just a very quick thought. I've never thought about this before, but I think it would consolidate even more power into companies like Facebook and Google who would be able to figure out how to handle some of those challenges in a way that smaller companies wouldn't, which is part of why one of the things I advocate for is like, the rule should apply to differently to different size companies, to uh, uh, all sorts mm -hmm. of things. But that would be my biggest fear: is it would actually consolidate all the power into fewer companies. We've just got two minutes left, so I want to make sure we get a chance. Ellen, do you have a question for either oh. David or Yale? Well, Yale had a question, so I don't want to. I don't want to jump right. to Ellen. No, I was going to ask David about the uh, the interrelationship between international standards for, you know, because uh, sometimes I hear, well, it doesn't matter what we do in the United States, because if they adopt better rules in Europe, then Facebook is going to have to just, and, and all the platforms will have to comply with those pretty much around the world because they can't have different standards in different places. I had a yeah. similar question, so great. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you I mean, and I, I think, we just like, like yeah. I think that's right. I mean, I actually think that, you know, the interesting thing to me is that uh, these rules are being made by Europeans. I mean, if anybody's getting moving a little more quickly, it's Europeans. And I think that's true because these are platforms that work at scale. They're going to go to, you know, essentially where's the most efficient place for them to be. I mean, this is why I've been arguing for the companies for a couple of years, you know, to be focused on adopting rules that are um, that are rooted in human rights standards and in international standards, because then at least as a as kind of real politic issue, you know they can um, they can sell it to governments. They can say, look, we are adopting the same standards and rules and obligations that you have to your own publics. To me, that's a better approach. Um, I mean, I do. There's a longer conversation to have about what those standards actually involve. But they do involve the kinds of things we've been talking about here around transparency, um, around kind of a baseline of freedom of expression, but with some ability uh, for restrictions in the case of harm. I, and I think that you know if we move in that direction, we're much better off than moving in the direction of having governments, you know, all jurisdictions having a different rule that's you know differentially applying to to content. Well, well, I know this is heartbreaking, but we are out of time. Uh, thank you all very much, Al, David, Ellen. Fascinating. I knew it was going to be. I knew the timing couldn't be better. And in these challenging times, uh, stay safe and wish you all well. We'll see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.